countless legends and poems, and all the articles have all memorized this man. And today, I just want to do a special episode to pay tribute to this man, and also to talk about his special relationship with this city, my local place, Hangzhou. The man have a profound name that I have no need to mention, but this city actually, as him told the people around him, was his second hometown. Now that was probably because this city reminds him of his hometown, Hunan. But it can also because that he spent a huge amount of time in this city, lived everywhere, and left all the traces, like all the big figures in the former dynasties. He developed. Such an obsession about this city, especially the areas around the West Lake. Now I'm going to introduce three places especially related to this man, and a profound work that he managed to achieve, which left such a tremendous influences upon all of us. Seventy-two years ago, there's a newly born republic. Appears in the eastern part of the world, emerged in a mysterious land that most people around the world have no knowledge of. Well, people have some reason to be pathetic about this country's future. First of all, it was so poor. The former regime just brought all the things worthy with them to a distant island, left the mainland traces and wound from previous wars. And people after the civil war wants to live a peace life, and that was the pressure on the party that take charge. The pressure was mostly on the shoulders of the leaders of the whole nation. A nation must need its own regulations, must need its own policies, and the fundamental law. And there comes the constitution. Now you may ask me, why is this related to this city? Well. It was in Hangzhou in 1953 that Mao first time have brought up the agenda of constitution, although they vote for it and made it through in Beijing. It is still in Hangzhou city, and they managed to do something about it. 1953 was the second time Mao had ever visited Hangzhou. The last time was like 30 years ago, but this time. He has brought some mission with him. He brought an agenda with him that is so important to the fate of the new republic. On Beishan Street, number eighty-four, a single flat building that standing in the middle of the hill. Anyone that observe it from the Beishan Street might not easily, you know, find it. But it was a place that Mao found for himself as his office during the time he wrote the draft of the constitution. They took the constitution as the first priority. Even till now, you can imagine how Mao is like, you know, wandering around, put his hands on his back and whisk, go around the office, and read some texts in his thick accent. This place is now a, a museum for the first constitution of China, and Hangzhou government take it as a sort of cultural heritage, which is good. But next time you pay a visit to Hangzhou. Make sure you visit the number 84 building on Beishan Street, where you can actually find some of the actual remains of the man himself, and how the predecessors fought for this whole new republic. The second thing I want to mention about is actually very related to this first place. During Mao's time staying in Hangzhou, a place he actually really liked to stay in at early stage. Was Liu Zhuang, roughly translated as Liu's Manor. Well, Liu Zhuang was now Xi Hu Guo Bin Guan, hospitality for those who are important guests for the city. And you know, but now ordinary people have just got the chance to live in that place. Only that you need to pay several thousands of yuan to live in that you know extraordinary luxury hotel. Nonetheless, Mao lived in this place for dozens of times. He himself also likes to do slightly sports. For example, he likes to jogging, or maybe walking, hiking around. He likes to climb the mountains and all the mountains around the West Lake. 
perhaps. That's one of the secrets that he kept his house. He even left a poem written on the wall of an abandoned temple, which now you can find his handwriting in. He accepted a visit for 32 times of the foreign representatives. Some of them are really well known. Next part, there won't be subtitles, but I hope you understand this. After the year of 1961, Mao stops liking to live in the Liu Zhuang. He commented on the newly decorated place he disliked about it, and he thought it was a waste of money. Somehow, he managed to live in another place, just near Leifeng Pagoda, and that is Wang Zhuang. That place now is Xizi Hotel, also an extraordinary luxury place for business uses. This place has witnessed the most significant matters in the 1960s and 1970s. One of the most profound matter is the Cultural Revolution. He read, reviewed, and commented on multiple materials from all over the country that time. And he made a judgment within him. A five-man group set up in Beijing earlier was assigned to lead and make the drafts on the Cultural Revolution. This group has failed to meet Mao's standards. They have proposed an outline, namely the February outline. Mao in Hangzhou lived underneath the Leifeng Pagoda in this place, reviewed about this, and he was not satisfied about it. He himself posed a strong influences and his personal styles in launching such a social experiment in China. They cannot just figure it out the right way to do it without Mao. Even Mao himself, perhaps, have no clear clue about the whole thing. Later on, as we all know, situation in Beijing shifts so dramatically, the announcement of May the 16th, which was recognized as the official starting point of the Cultural Revolution. Mao had finally decided within him, for the first part, it was in Hangzhou, and facing such a beautiful series, was to improve China from the old track of the bureaucracy systems, and second part, follow a certain kind of ideology, which was not so popular nowadays. And third of all, Mao has what he called a long-existed idea from his very childhood. Research has found that he has already believed that, you know, the orders come from the chaotic or Da Luan Da Zhi. That is some idea pretty interesting. Until now, I think little people understand it at all. Well, let's not talk about whether it's right or wrong to do so, but at least let us figure out that, well, this city has something to do within such a matter. Of course, there are a lot of other places that Mao has ever visited or left his trace on. But here we just, you know, doesn't include them all so that it's not overwhelmed for you guys. There are places like Xiaoyun Ali, are also famous for the visits of Mao himself. The legacies and heritage of Mao's era are also so rich in the city or even in the whole country. Some major achievements are also accomplished in that time especially in terms of industries or second industry. Here I read such an expression. The reports from the committee of Zhejiang has um, described Hangzhou city as such a city, a consumer city. They said in the 1960s that Hangzhou has transformed from a consuming city to a producing city. It can produce itself goods. It used to be full of merchants. And merchandise. It used to be a commercialized city where the capital are concentrated. Well, somehow, after a transformation, the city has established its own industries and can feed itself. It's just such an achievement. Hangzhou has taken big steps back. Now, of course, it's, it's more relying on the district level of cooperation. What it had achieved long ago was lost long. The heritage of Mao, of course, lasted so long, and his influences were so profound to this city. I mean, the human being itself was 
largely changed by this great figure. He is a giant. He is a predecessor. You know, he is somebody that I, I can't comment and rate. He is just somebody that worth our worship, but not that kind of religious worship. What he want from us is make us the owner of the country, the real master of of sovereignty. And of course, we are the master of ourselves, of our own fate. Well, I think the best way to memorize him is stop being a cynic. Do not be a cynic. Be somebody productive, and be somebody really master the fate of yourself. And this is the end of this episode.